Hello, New Life family. We're so glad that you have joined us here online. If you're looking for ways to give or ways to connect at New Life, check out the link below. And now it's time for worship. So we'd like to invite you to participate with us. Once I was lost, wandering in darkness. No life inside, no hope inside, but he called my name, and he healed my blindness, set me ablaze, and now I'm alive with love breaking through my heart of stone, love breathing to awake my bones, love reaching out to save my soul, love never gonna let me Good to be here today. Good to be a part of this family. And uh, it's good to have the weather cool down a little bit, right? Uh, some of you are going, man, I missed those 115 degree days. It was just uh, amazing. Uh, hey, I want you to get your Bibles out today. And I want you to turn to the book of Genesis. It's the first book in the Bible. It should be pretty easy to find. If you have a physical Bible or uh, if you have a digital one, just find Genesis chapter 12. Uh, and I want you just to hold that. We're not going to read it for a little bit, but I want you to, to hold it there in that. So before we dive in today, uh, I want to take a moment just to, just to pray uh, for this time, but also to make you aware of uh, something happened this week. So this church has been around since the, the mid-70s, and uh, we've been able to be a part of it. Like, you've seen all this for 30 years, and we just feel so blessed and honored. But there have been so many people who have been instrumental, who have truly been foundational, like, like pillars in our church, 
who have prayed, who have served, who have loved, who have, who have given again and again and again. And we, we in a lot of ways, uh, stand on their shoulders uh, of their faithfulness. And uh, this week, one of the pillars of our church passed away suddenly. Uh, Barbara Shumway uh, went to be with the Lord on, on Friday unexpectedly. Uh, some of you know Jim and Barbara, and uh, we were just really uh, kind of so surprised and taken aback by that. Uh, but I, I just want to take a moment and uh, pray for Jim and the Shumway family as they walk through this time of, of grief and loss, that God would just be faithful in standing with them, and that that we as a family together would, would recognize the gifts uh, that we have received and the, you know, those who have walked among us and those who continue uh, in faithfulness. And that just continues, right? Generation to generation as we continue to serve the Lord and he continues to do his work in us. And so we wanna pick up that mantle that has been carried for us. So would you bow your heads with me today? Father, I, I just wanna thank you today for your goodness and your faithfulness to us. And, Thank you, God, that no matter what else is going on, we can hold on to you. And knowing even more than that, Lord, that you are holding on to us. And Lord, we thank you today for Barbara and for her faith and her, her life and the impact that she had on so many. And we pray for Jim today and his family as they walk through this season. And God, we know that Barbara is with you and she is in your kingdom and we celebrate that today, but the loss um, we still experience and we feel that today. So surround us today, Lord. Surround Jim and their family. And now, Lord, as we open your word, I pray, Lord, that you would make it alive to us. God, we, we're not looking for another history lesson. We're not looking for, for hoops to jump through. God, we want to lean in to life with you, to relationship with you. So, Lord, just make this, this time, this this talk, the study that we join into, I pray to God that our, our hearts would just connect with it in, in a deep way. Because Jesus, more than anything else, we want you to be our teacher. We want you to be the one who leads us today. So we give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, last week we kicked off this series called After the Amen. And we're, we're diving into this tension, this space that we experience between the amen and the answer, right? And amen literally in the Hebrew means so be it. It's this kind of declaration at the end of our, of our prayer that we're just saying, that's it. Maybe even a, a more modern way of saying it would be, and that's the way it is. We're just kind of laying it out there for God. But it's not just like a period or some kind of um, you know, language thing that we put on the end of a sentence that we're praying to God. It really is this declaration of God, this is in your hands. As you will, so be it. And so we're looking at those times when we pray and say, God, this is in your hands, but then waiting like, like what happens in the middle of this? Like, like what's next? And it's this middle place. And this middle place between those two can be scary and lonely and frustrating even at times. It can be unnerving for us. It can cause us to be anxious and worried. And yet when you look through the Bible, you realize God didn't intend for us to live in those kinds of places. Now I know we go there, I know I go there. But his desire and his intention for us is to live in a different kind of place. See, I bring my own worries and I bring my own triggers and, and I bring my own past wounds from my life. I bring all of that into the mix. And so I wonder, God, are you going to be there for me? Or, or are you going to take care of this? Or am I going to have to do it myself? I mean, that's what I'm bringing into it. But God has something else. He desires this middle space between the amen and the answer to actually be a place of peace and quiet and calm. He desires that, that place to be a reflective time and a trusting time. That's God's heart for the in-between. As I was studying for this, it, it made me think of uh, when our kids were young, there were times if we were 
I don't know, out somewhere if we'd gone to a ball game or some kind of event or even to the mall or to the store or whatever it is. And maybe there was a lot of people around. And my, usually one or more of my kids would ask, Dad, can I, can I get on your shoulders? And so it was twofold. One is when you're six, five, your kids like being like way up and on top of everything, right? You know, they can look down. The other one is they just don't want to walk anymore. And you're like, oh, come on. But I would put them on my shoulders and no matter how chaotic the crowd was, no matter how crazy things got, they were above that. And guess what? They were safe because they knew that dad had them. And I think about the tension that we live in when it comes to the, the amen and the answer. And God's inviting us to come and to lean into him, to find his strength and his presence and his comfort, even though everything may be swirling around us. There may be chaos and there may be struggle in that, but he has something more for us. For those waiting times, he has his presence. In fact, you think about uh, one of the most famous Psalms, Psalm 23, right? That's the picture of this. The Lord is my shepherd. Remember what David writes? I have everything I need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And how about this phrase? He refreshes my soul. And he guides me along right paths for his namesake. Those are the places of complete trust and surrender and connection to the Father who uniquely designed us to have this living, breathing, kind of dual, you know, back and forth relationship between him and us. And he's inviting in the, us in this to, to come ever closer. And that's the invitation to prayer, right? Right? The invitation to come close is an invitation to pray. And we have sometimes formalized it, which there's some really beautiful written prayers that we can use and we can read. But understand that God is inviting us to, to connect with him, to know him, to know his heart as he knows ours, and to walk with him in that. And in that place of prayer, we find something different than just trying to manage our own things. We find God's peace. Last Sunday at the very end, uh, we sang this old song together. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And then listen to this. The song goes, oh, what peace we often forfeit and oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And God is kind of consistently and, and, and constantly prompting and urging us to bring those burdens and those petitions to him. And, and that's, that's this picture of prayer. And as we learn, the answer to our prayer begins to follow in this amen. But it's not always immediate, is it? And I think that's the struggle. We've experienced that. So what do we do in the waiting? We keep going to him. We lean into his word. We find his guidance and his instruction and his, his commands to us to, to follow him step by step by step. And he will guide us in that. So back years ago when uh, Gina and I worked with students and uh, every summer we would do uh, camps and different things and go backpacking with students and it was just a great time. And one of the things, one of the activities that we did in uh, in those summer times is we would teach uh, the students who ever wanted to, to do some rappelling. And some of you are going, I have a teenage boy, he's pretty repellent. Yeah, but not that kind of thing. It's actually like with harnesses and ropes and all that, and we would do a little rock climbing and that it was a ton of fun. And it was all safety lines. We had everything in place for that. But every once in a while, there would be a student or two, they would get partway down the wall. And if you've ever done rappelling, the key is you need to lean back, trust the rope. There's a whole metaphor to this, but you trust the rope and you keep taking the steps. But every once in a while, some, uh, a student would just freeze and it would just be that, <gasps> and what they would do is they would immediately grab the rope and they would go spread eagle then on the, on the rock. And you know, just like, <gasps> and, and you just thought, okay, you got to lean back. And they're like, no, 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 I can't do that. And, and you go, okay, listen to me. Okay, I want you, and you try to give them some instructions and you'd hear over and over, I can't do that, 
I can't do that. I can't do that. And, and they may only be like eight feet off the ground. This isn't like Tom Cruise, 300 feet in the air, you know, in some thing. They're just on the wall and they don't know what to do. Because they're, they're just frozen there in fear. And so what we would do is we would talk to them, you know, gently. Okay, what you want to do, want to lean back. I know it's counterintuitive. I want you to lean back a little bit. And then we would literally direct their steps. So I want you to take your right foot. I want you to slide it over a little bit. I know you can't see it right now. I want you to slide. Do you feel that little ledge there? Okay, I want you to put your weight on there. Okay, I want you to take your hand. I want you to move it. You feel that right there? Okay, just hold on right there. And step by step, moment by moment, both feet, both hands, we would guide them down the rest of the rock to a safe place. Now, some of you I know have never been rock climbing. You've never had a rope on like that. But you've probably felt that same thing if you've ever been like putting something up on a shelf in your house and you're on a little ladder and you somehow lose it a little bit and you don't know where the next step is and someone will take your foot and put it on the rung. You know that happen? It's like someone's literally directing your steps to get you to a safe place. That's kind of how our prayer and our waiting ends up playing out. We pray and we bring sometimes really heavy, hard things to God. And in our fear and in our struggle, we, we latch on to our own answers and our own way. And sometimes we just freeze in those moments and we don't know what to do and we don't know if we can hang on and we're stuck. And all through the Bible, we see that God wants to guide your next steps. He wants to lead you to trust him, to rely on him, to follow him step by step. And it's not just any old step that feels right to you, but his steps and his way. In the Old Testament, there was a man named Abram. His name was later changed to Abraham. You may know that. But in this time, and we're gonna look here at, at Genesis chapter 12, God was doing something new and he was establishing his people and he was calling out Abram to respond to him. And so I want you to follow along with me. Genesis chapter 12, we're gonna start in verse one. We're just gonna read a few verses, but I want you to see the process that took place and what ultimately God was inviting Abram into because we're gonna learn some things about ourselves in this. So it says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. Now catch this. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. Now we're gonna stop right there for a moment. Now I want you to kind of step back a little bit and I want you to kind of catch what's happening in here. God says, go, go now. No real details. He doesn't say, you know, go over this next mountain to that village you already know, take a left, go into the wilderness. It doesn't say that. He just says, go and I'll show you the place. Now what was, what was God saying here, really? I mean, we can read the actual words that he was saying, but, but what was God's heart and God's direction in this? Here's what it was. Follow me and trust me because I've got you. Follow me and trust me because I've got you. And Abram then hears the promises that, that, that God is, is going to uh, kind of bring to him in his obedience. And then there's this amazing step of faith. It says, so Abram went. God said go, and Abram went. And I'll tell you, I truly am in awe of that kind of faith and obedience that just responds instantaneously when God says go. And I've read it multiple times, and I, I think I've even done a message or two on that passage before. I just love that, that response of faith in that. But there's a little part at the end of this that I think gets kind of swallowed up in everything else. And that's actually the part that I want to zero in on today. And here's what it says. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. As the Lord had told him. Abram wasn't just heading off to what he thought was right. He wasn't directing the show. He was going 
God's way. He was following the Lord's lead. And for us, after the amen in the waiting, God's inviting us to follow him, to follow his lead, to take the next right step. And again, it's not just simply the step that I think is right, but it's leaning into his ways in this. And so you may be listening to this today and going, that sounds fantastic, Dave. I, I really like that. But how do I do that, right? How do I know what the next right step is? How in the world do I follow his lead? Well, we start with the steps that he's already given to us. And all through the Bible, all through God's word, we're invited and instructed to walk in his ways. And so in this time of waiting, it's not just a do-nothing static posture, right? We talked about this last week a little bit. We sometimes think waiting is like the waiting room, like I'm not doing anything. But throughout the Bible, waiting on God is active trust. God is inviting you and I to stay attentive to him and obedient in the waiting, to, to pray the prayer and to say our amen, to bring that to him, but then to trust him in the tension of the middle while you're waiting. Think about all that, all that the Bible invites us into, right? Those aren't put on hold. We don't pause those things. We continue to take those steps. So while I'm waiting, I keep loving and serving other people. While I'm waiting, I still surrender and submit to, to my spouse and to, to my leaders and those in authority. The Bible tells us that, right? While I wait, I keep studying and, and reading God's word. While I wait, I stay connected in community with other believers because the Bible tells us don't give up the habit of meeting together. While I wait, I continue to worship and thank and praise God. While I wait, I engage deeply in those quiet moments, those times of silence and solitude. That's active trust. It's active waiting. Think about it. What exactly are we waiting for after the amen? An answer, right? But is it an answer? Or are we really waiting for the answer? See, we pray for specific things, and God invites us to do that. It says, bring your request to me. But ultimately, the answer is Jesus himself right in the middle of my circumstances. The answer I'm looking for, what I'm hoping for in my life, is Jesus with me now. See, the circumstances may not shift. I may not get the answer that, that I want, but Jesus is with me, and he's the answer. And so we pursue him. And I'm just gonna tell you, you're gonna hear that from me a lot in this message. Pursue Jesus. So before I give you a couple things to write down, um, I wanna just clear the air around this a little bit, because I know this is, this is hard and we wrestle with it. I know in some ways what you're going to hear today as we walk through this is not very satisfying, Ultimate, ultimately. I mean, th there's this satisfaction that we come knowing that God is with us. But in the moment, it doesn't seem satisfying because we want things fixed and we want our circumstances to change. We want our friend to not have cancer and, and we want a new job that we, we can finally like. And we don't want God to just be some vending machine that we put in our prayer and, and he, you know, we kind of control that. Or we, we don't want him to be a genie where, you know, we get three wishes. We want a father who responds with, with loving kindness and grace and wisdom. But we want an answer. And we really want it now. And that's what makes the waiting so hard. Because in the waiting, we start questioning and we start wondering, God, are you really there? God, it's all right. <laughs> Usually they're going the other way, so I'm just, you know. <laughs> all you parents are sitting here going, yep, I've been there, I've been there. <laughs> hey, no worries, man, no worries. But, but this is why the waiting is so hard, right? God, where are you in this? 
We wondered, do my prayers make any difference at all? Is God gonna respond? And so here's the thing, and this is the challenge, and I do this and you probably do as well. It's easier at times just to manage and control and try to figure it out on our own. I'll do it. I'll hold it. I'll make it happen. Because we don't know what to do in the waiting. So I get it. I'm there sometimes too. But can I tell you something? In the prayer and in the waiting, God wants to do deeper things in you and in me. Deeper things. He, he wants us to know him and to trust him. Even when there's silence, even when there's waiting, even when it still seems dark, he wants to strengthen our faith in him for things that we can't even see yet that are still in the future to come. I wanna read you a quote from Elizabeth Elliot. Elizabeth and her husband Jim were missionaries years ago down in Ecuador. I'm talking like I know them, I don't. I've just read their books. Um, if you've ever read the story Through Gates of Splendor, you read the story of Jim and some other missionaries who were brutally murdered as they were sharing God's love with a tribe uh, in the jungles of Ecuador. And you can probably imagine the grief and the pain that Elizabeth went through as she was trying to figure out the loss of her husband. And again, there were several others as they tried to navigate through. And I'm sure there were times that they were wondering, like, God, what? they were doing your work. Like, how, how in the world can this happen? And there was this time of, of darkness and, and waiting in her life. And she wrote this statement. It was, in, it was in a book that she had written, but man, this thing just, just really grabbed me. Here, here's what she wrote. He makes us wait and he keeps us on purpose in the dark. He makes us walk when we want to run, sit still when we want to walk. Now listen, for he has things to do in our souls we're not interested in. See, God wants to do a deeper work in you and in me. And there's sometimes we're not sure we want to go there. Because we know that even though God loves us and his grace is for us and that in his loving kindness he, he stands with us, we know that when we go to those deeper places and those wounds in our life, there's sometimes an unraveling that happens. There's sometimes an exposure. There's healing that has to take place. And sometimes it's just hard. And God will lead us to places where there's sometimes it just feels dark or where we feel that there's silence, but he is not far away. He hasn't abandoned us. But in his wisdom and in his great love, he wants to do deeper things in our souls that we're not even sure we wanna go there yet. But he wants to make us holy. The waiting is challenging, but he's with us in the wait. And I know you've heard me say this before, but nothing is wasted. God is using this time, this season, these struggles in my life and in yours to love us, to refine us, to deepen us in him. So let me give you just a couple things. I want you to write these down today if you've got your note sheet. The first is this. My next right step is to pursue Jesus in his ways. While we're waiting, Jesus desires us to pursue him. Not my ways, not my, what I think is right. And, and like, what does this mean? Well, it means to pursue Jesus all you can, while you can, where you can, and when you can. While you're waiting, you take every opportunity to lean into him in every situation. Is it somehow to earn points with God so that he'll answer your prayer sooner? No. We talked about that last week. We don't earn our way to an answered prayer. But we continue to do what his word tells us to do, even in the waiting, to not give up, to keep moving towards him. Look at how Paul talked about it in his letter to the Galatians. He said, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. Don't get tired of following after him and pursuing him. Have you ever been completely exhausted? Some of you are like, Dave, I can't even raise my hand. I'm just completely exhausted right now, right? 
And if you, if you have kids, man, you, you sometimes stay in a, in a rhythm, a season of exhaustion in your life. You may not even realize how you got here today. I mean, you're just that tired. In fact, if you think about it, the two most common responses when people ask, hey, how are you doing? Are The first is, hey, I'm good, which may be an absolute lie, but that's what we say, right? I'm good. And the second one, especially during these last couple of years of COVID, is I'm kind of tired. And sometimes we even combine them both. I'm, I'm good and tired. You know, we just bring all that together. And I think we, we get that way sometimes waiting on God to respond and to answer. We get weary and tired, especially in those seasons of thinking, I don't know if I can pray this much anymore because my loved one is still sick, God, and I'm still struggling in my job and my mental state is a mess right now. But listen, listen. As we stay attuned to Jesus, that becomes our next step. That becomes the great next right step. To pursue him, to stay in tune with, you, with him, to, to leave that prayer in God's hands and find opportunities to continue leaning in close. God used Paul to encourage us to never get tired of doing good because at just the right time, there is blessing that is coming if we don't give up. Then look what it says in that verse. Whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. You know what that is? That's the people you're sitting around today. You get to take the next right step, pursuing Jesus by loving those around you. But it's not just here in this room, it's people throughout our community. It's, it's the mission that we have here to love people one step closer to Jesus. That's why we do a food pantry to reach hundreds and hundreds of families to give them some food to eat in this crazy time that we're in because we can love them just one step closer. It's why we wanna go down to Mexico and work at the orphanage there just, just to love them closer to Jesus. The New Testament uses this phrase, one another, dozens of times. Encourage one another, love one another, pray for one another, serve one another, on and on and on. And we don't do those just when we feel like it or when we want our prayers answered. That's the call for every single one of us, moment by moment. What's my next right step? Do what the Bible says. Encourage someone today, love someone today, pray for someone today. Because in the waiting time, nothing is wasted. God is using it all. He's using it all from his timing to our next steps to further his kingdom. Trust that you are a part of that, even in the waiting. Paul wrote this, so my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Write this down for number two. My next right step is to love God and love others. That's what we were just moving into. It's a great way to remind us that it's ultimately not really about us. Yes, I'm bringing my request to God in prayer and he tells me to do that, but he also reminds me to trust his will and his way and that his plans and his purposes are woven together with kingdom good and with other people as well. It's, it's a shift in perspective for me. Paul said, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, but be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So how do we love God and love others? Well, we put him first, we seek his kingdom first, and we open ourselves to his leading us to opportunities to be a blessing to those around us. Loving God and loving each other. Jesus said these are the most important commandments in which we live our lives. And while we wait in the gap between the amen and the answer, we keep our eyes on him, desiring his will and focused on his kingdom so that our hearts can stay in that place of, of tender alignment. I'm gonna ask our worship team to come on out as we start bringing this to a close. And they're gonna sing a song uh, at the end. And just, we actually just want you to sit back and just listen to this. Because here's the thing, we've said our amen and we're gonna occupy our time, our mind and our heart by pursuing Jesus in his ways. And by doing that, love God and love others.
Paul wrote, pray for us too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. You don't have to wait to do that. You don't have to manage and manipulate after the amen. You can take the next right step, God's right step right now, today, tomorrow, and in the days to come. But remember, it all starts with prayer, with coming to Jesus, bringing it all to him. And in his name, things happen. In his name, miracles begin. For his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Listen to the words of this song. I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name, cause it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I'll pray for your healing. Circumstances will change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus. I speak the name of all authority, declaring blessings, every promise he is faithful to keep. I speak the name no grave could ever hold. He is greater, he is stronger, he's the I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
So what do you want to bring to Jesus today? What is it that you're praying for? Because he's present. He's here. He's listening. He's responding. And then after the amen, you can take the next step as he's leading and directing you. Abram, we looked at him, right? He took the next right step. Before knowing the details, we're waiting for God to, to map out the where and the when and the how. He just went as the Lord told him to trust in the step, to trust in the waiting. In Psalm 37, David wrote, when Yahweh, that name of the creator God, the all omnipotent God, when Yahweh delights in how you live your life, he establishes your every step. Would you stand with me? I want us to pray. Jesus, we thank you for your presence, for your love, for your kindness towards us, for your invitation to come and to pray, to bring our requests. And Lord, we don't have to get the words right. We don't have to somehow manipulate or manage or any of those things. You just invite us to come, to come. And as we do, Lord, you are with us. And in that time of, of waiting and wondering, you desire to bring us your peace. And Lord, our, I pray, Lord, that our, our hearts would stay attuned to you you're leading, you're guiding, directing to take the next right step in you. And God, I pray for each of us as we head out into this week with school and work, and home and what, whatever the things that are engaged in our life, Lord, that, that we would hold on to you, pursue you and see you at work. We love you and we thank you. We pray all this today in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, a couple things, a couple things let you go. Um, if you're new to new life, and maybe this is your first time or maybe a couple times, um, I know walking into the doors of a new church can be intimidating and all those things, but we're so glad that you're here. And we hope that you sense God's here today and that he's for you, but we would like a chance just to say hi. And so out in the middle of our lobby, there's this thing there called Starting Point. Just stop by and just say, hey, I'm new here. We have a little gift for you, and just a chance to kind of introduce ourselves and to get to know you a little bit. So I hope you'll do that. Don't forget all the other things that are starting going on this week. I'd uh, love to have you be a part of those things. So thanks for being here today. Have a great week.